In any event, we can do it through genetics, recombinant DNA, and in fact, there's a whole field called transgenesis, where we are picking the DNA from a, an organism and transplanting it into some, <laughs> some other wow. organism, and we're creating multiple, you know, uh, benefits. The point is that who is a transhuman? Anyone who is living the world of the tomorrow, for example, people with implants, with transplants, people who have new values, people who are transglobal, people who've gone out of this planet, people who want to live forever. What about so makeup? People are wearing a lot of makeup. <laughs> well, if you can redo your face, if you can redo your body, why not? That's an aspect of the future because there will come a time when genetic engineering will take the place of what is called uh, cosmetic surgery, right? And we will be able to do massive changes. Oh, how do you do that? If, for that example, you're good. short, yeah, you want to be tall, you can be tall. If you're uh, dark-haired or dark-skinned, you want to be light-skinned. If you're light-skinned, you want to be dark-skinned. The point is, is that surgery? we will have... No, well, it'll be through genetics, gene therapy, gene incision, gene uh, uh, recombination, and we're at the very, very beginning of it. No, what, what, we'll be around for this, though, right? Oh, absolutely. I certainly plan to be around. I'm okay, sure we well, will I'm be around. Okay, well, I'm sticking with you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll link up with him, and we'll, right. be, we'll be now, there. FM, does this mean that nobody's ever going to have babies the old-fashioned way, the way Gail and I did? I mean... Screaming or Remember heads that? Up. I would say yes. Yeah, sometime 10, 15 years from now, people will say, well, "What a bore carrying you know baby for nine months. Why not you know what do for? it? Do exactly do it outside the body, and we'll also be able to monitor it better. And as for you know living far into the future, please bear in mind that I'm not suggesting we live with these pristine bodies. I mean, already people are walking around with a lot of prosthesis and so on. And I'm suggesting there will come a time when we will be able to replace very nearly any part of the body. Now, if there are parts of the body you're particularly attached to, I'd say hold on to them. Oh, but if, oh. <laughs> I, want, I, I want somebody. I want somebody who's linking up with me to hold on to them. <laughs> okay. That's 2030 too. FM 2030. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. This Thank was a you. lot of fun. We want to hear more about that. We'll be right back to the present. Women today want in a man tall, dark, and handsome, and disease-free. Statistics show that some promises made in the dark will result in 14 million new cases of sexually transmitted diseases this year alone. Now, this has created a whole new area of the law. This was in the paper this week. A headline, this woman, Annie Bakes, is suing this man, Dennis Rodman. You know, he's the power forward for the Detroit Pistons. She says that he gave her venereal disease, and she wants a million dollars and half of his NBA playoff money. I mean, this has created a whole new area of the law. With us now is a woman who is an expert in that area. She's the author of a book called Lovers, Doctors, and the Law, and we all have to know about this. She is attorney Margaret Davis. began with the Rock Hudson case. And how fast is this kind of litigation growing? It's really mushrooming. And actually, Gail, these cases are quite old. Since the early 1800s, we've had cases between spouses involving syphilis and gonorrhea. And people recovered large dollar damages. So there's nothing new about the cases at all. It's just the celebrities now, for instance, this case, that's bringing it to the forefront of our attention. All right, but it's not a good idea. It's not a good way to make money. It's really not. <laughs> <laughs> how are these cases being resolved? You know, oftentimes a defendant will quickly settle out of court as soon as his court date approaches. Well, you look very scary, that's why. <laughs> Doesn't you look scary? <laughs> no, a lot, a lot of people in our audience have some questions. That's right, I'm canvassing them. And, uh, Margaret, how do you get into a discussion of disease with your sexual partner? This is what they're asking here. Well, you know, I'm asked this all the time, especially by my single friends. I'm single. And really, a sense of humor is really important. For instance, you might say to your lover, Ah, I won't reveal to you what's in my bank account, but I'll do much better. I'll reveal to you what's my sexual and health secrets. It's a really good way to break the ice and kind of open up. Boy, times wow. are changing. Your name? Hi, I'm Christy Anderson from North Carolina. I had a question. Um, one time I dated a man who told me he did have a disease, but that it went away and, well, he got it cured. But what if I do catch something? Am I responsible? You might be if you do not tell your partner. And few people realize that failure to tell your partner 
can result in criminal liability, that means time in jail, or even dollar damages. As you've just seen in the Rock Hudson case, very large damages for failure to make that honest promise in the dark. How, how long has been the, somebody been in jail for? There's a fellow in Oklahoma who's in jail now in his fifth year of a sentence for infecting his uh, teenage girlfriend with a venereal disease. And no conjugal visits for him, right? <laughs> I don't no. think so. No. <laughs> Maybe misdemeanors or felonies, at least. <laughs> okay, we have a few more people. Your name? Yes, my name is Tara Mitchell. I'm from Pasadena, California. If you ask your, ask your mate or the person you're dating, would, would you take a blood test? And they get upset, like, why are you ask me that? You know, you saying I'm not trustworthy. Does that mean that they have a disease and they don't want to, you know, face it or discuss it? You know, I saw this great greeting card today that said, hey, let's go out on a first date, a little dancing, a little dinner, a little cocktails, and a blood test. <laughs> and it's really true because it's now a life and death situation. And I think partners want to hear from each other questions about their sexual and health history. And it's really important to make that honest commitment to your partner. So you can come right out and say, if I sleep with you, will I die? It's an excellent approach. <laughs> oh, we hate that. All right. It might work. <laughs> What's your name? Hi, I'm Kim Taylor from Connecticut. I asked a guy I was dating about his sexual past, and he didn't exactly want to tell me anything. I didn't end up dumping him, but don't you think this is just another obstacle in getting into a relationship, which pretty much already hard to get into? Yeah, as unromantic as it sounds, you've really now got to inquire as to your partner these important issues. And if somebody really cares about you, they'll tell you. They really yeah, will. Yeah, we're talking life or death. Now, I have a man over here who wants to give us his point of view. <laughs> What is your name? My name is Leighton Banks, and I'm from New York City. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> for myself, you know, um, I, you know, when I ask a woman, you know, like, when was the last time you did the wild thing, you know, or <laughs> been with somebody, you know, I, I, I get a pretty decent response, you know, because maybe the way I ask them or the way I approach them, because I'm, I'm being more careful today. You know, I don't want to catch nothing that I didn't start off with, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's really hard. So what do you do in cases where people just don't want to give up the information? On God's side, it, it looks, a lot of times it looks different than what it seems to be, you know? Like we rats, but we ain't all rats, so that's right. some of us. Right, the trick is to have this talk way before you're in an intimate situation. A long walk, in the kitchen. The secret is always before you engage in sexual intimacy. It's like, okay, how can you tell if, and are you diseased? <laughs> <laughs> it's simple. How can you tell if they're lying? Well, you know, you've got to get to know your partner well enough to believe in the representations that they make to you. It's really a judgment call. And if you have any doubt, always exercise caution. Can you possibly prove, you know, that this is the guy who did, this is the rat who did it, you know, in court, instead of some other rat? In fact, Kelly, you can. We have a new test called a DNA fingerprint test, and at least with the genital herpes, you can actually pinpoint the source of the infection. So where a defendant claims, it wasn't me, it was Mr. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, if the medical evidence indicates otherwise, he can be found guilty. Wait, are you saying that his fingerprints are still on you? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> okay, now you've said that we should, in your legal checklist, share his medical history, share his sexual history, and you've also said that we should have reciprocal exams. Explain that. Well, you know, oftentimes in lovemaking, it's a good idea to take a, uh, a moment and discuss this with your partner and take a look at one another and, and make it a part of uh, being together in special intimacy. If your eyes are not that good, <laughs> uh, would you suggest glasses or a magnifying glass? <laughs> well, you know, it's always a good idea to really know your partner very well. But that's sort of like foreplay with the lights on. Huh? <laughs> okay, Margaret Davis, thanks very much for being with us. Thank, Thank you, you, audience. You were great. Today, we're recommending three movies. Now, these will be in your video stores by the weekend. And as always, we rate them on how they deal with relationships. Absolutely. Beaches, starring Bette Midler and Barbara Hershey, is the story of two best friends who meet on the beach as children and continue their relationship through adulthood, marriages, divorces, careers, depressions, and other sordid angst. 
And it just goes to prove that while men promise to love you forever, Kelly, women will always be there. That's right, your women friends. And Coming to America is out now. Eddie Murphy is an African prince, and Arsenio Hall is his best pal. And they come to America to find a bride for Prince Eddie. Well, he finds a girl, and in return, she gets him. And I hope half his country, huh? <laughs> now, isn't this every woman's fantasy, having a rich, handsome prince fall in love with her? It's sort of like Prince Rainier and Princess Grace, only darker. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Dangerous Liaisons is a clever, sexy period piece about a lascivious love triangle. Glenn Close and John Malkovich plot the seduction of a young, virtuous woman. This film is set in the 18th century when young, virtuous women still existed. <laughs> and in most of the movie, Glenn Close looks like you did in that dress. Oh, my she God. She does. She's fantastic. <laughs> now, tomorrow we will examine futile attractions, why we women so often have the right feelings for the wrong guy. I do that. <laughs> See you tomorrow.